Good morning, Grace and friends. Today's sermon is entitled, Joseph and Jesus and the Book of Forgiveness. Martin Luther said that we should rise every morning from the sleep with the words, I am baptized. Today I have another suggestion. Every day we should rise from sleep with a phrase from the Apostles' Creed, I believe in the forgiveness of sins. Do you? One of the most important things in life, most central to our well-being, is forgiveness. To accept forgiveness from God, to be able to forgive others who have hurt you, and to be able to forgive your own self. It is so important that we might call the whole book of Genesis and the whole Bible the book of forgiveness. It begins in the Garden of Eden when Adam and Eve were naked and ashamed and God made clothes for them out of animal skins. God wanted them free from guilt and shame, forgiveness. And Cain, he had just murdered his brother Abel. God sent him out into the wilderness. Sin has consequences sent him out as a a fugitive and vagabond. But God placed a mark on Cain's forehead that told people, do not harm this man. Forgiveness. The mark did not stigmatize him as a murderer. It protected him. That's when forgiveness starts with all of us as God forgives us. And the Jacob story. He had cheated his brother Esau out of his birthright and blessing and deceived his father. His mother Rebecca helped him escape his brother's murderous rage. Years later, he was returning home and heard that Esau was on the way to meet him with 400 men and kill him. That night, Jacob wrestled with an angel, with God, with self in the Jabbok River, an all-night wrestling. At dawn, he left blessed, and he left wounded, his hip wrenched out of socket. That next morning, the brothers met. Esau saw Jacob coming, limping on his hip. Jacob bowed himself before his brother. Then Esau raised him up, embraced him, wept, and kissed him. Jacob wept too and said, To see your face is like seeing the face of God. And now the last story in Genesis, the story of Joseph. Russian novelist Tolstoy said it was the most perfect story ever written. It is supremely a forgiveness story. You know it well. Joseph grew up his father's favorite among the 12 sons. His father Jacob doted on him and his brothers hated him. He was an insufferable, spoiled, entitled, brat. His father Jacob gave him a splendid coat of many colors and Joseph wore it like a neon sign that said, Father loves me best. He had a dream where 11 bundles of wheat bowed down to his bundle of wheat. Then he told the dream to his brothers. They didn't have to be Sigmund Freud to get the point and they hated him even more. Then one day when Father Jacob sent Joseph out with food for his other sons, Joseph got to them and they jumped him and stripped him and threw him into a deep pit and plotted to kill him. A caravan appeared heading to Egypt and they decided to sell their brother into slavery. Then they dipped Joseph's coat in animal's blood and returned to their father with a terrible lie. 
a wild beast has killed your son. Father, Jacob crumbled. I will wear my clothes of mourning until I die. And he nearly did. Joseph arrived in Egypt then, a slave imprisoned. From there, he improbably, impossibly, except for God, rose to be prince, viceroy of Egypt, the Pharaoh's right-hand man. One day, the Pharaoh came to him with an, for the interpretation of a troubling dream of seven fat cows being eaten by seven skinny cows. Joseph told him that the seven fat cows meant that the next seven years would be years of plenty, and the seven skinny cows meant that seven years of famine would follow. You'd better be prepared, Joseph said. And the Pharaoh said, you've got a job. Joseph, as prince, led the nation to store reserves of grain in the good years so that they could survive in the bad ones and not only survive themselves, but also help starving nations around them. When famine hit the region, Joseph's 10 brothers, minus the youngest, Benjamin, traveled to Egypt to buy grain. When they bowed before Joseph, remember the dream, they did not recognize that the prince of Egypt before them was their brother whom they had sold into slavery. Now to the last two scenes in Genesis. When Joseph broke down and told them that he was their brother, they were afraid for their lives, fearing that Joseph would wreak revenge on them. But Joseph calmed them and said these remarkable words. Do not be distressed that you sold me here. It was to save life that God sent me here, to save the lives of many, and to save your lives. So do not waste yourself in grief. This is a view from eternal places. Joseph could see the workings of God in it all. And now the last scene of the book. Father Jacob had just died, and the brothers again cowered in fear before Joseph, afraid that with Father Jacob gone, Joseph would unleash his rage and take revenge on them. When they cried out their fear, Joseph said these words to them, Do not be afraid, for am I in the place of God? As a boy, he had acted a little like God, that he was above them. But now, as one who has gone through great trial and suffering, sometimes we have to hit bottom in order to look up, he had grown wise and compassionate. Then he uttered these words which ring down through history to us today. You meant it for evil, but God meant it for good. Or in Everett Fox's great translation, you planned ill against me, but God planned it over for good. Our God is a planning it over kind of God. A God who works in the midst of the worst that can happen to bring about our good and the good of the world. Can you believe that God can take evil and turn it into good? Can you believe that God can take the evil done to you and turn it into good? Can you believe that God can take the evil you have done and turn it into good, even your own salvation? That's the view from heavenly places. That's the view from the cross. God is planning it over all the time. That's what redemption is is all about. Which brings us now to the words of Jesus from that cross. Words that have changed the world, words that can change your life. 
Abba, Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. These words began a forgiveness movement which now reaches around the world. Of course, we might say, well, they did know what they were doing, but not really, not fully, nor do we know the harm we have done or the extent of it. I've always been moved by the Iona prayer of confession. Before God, with the people of God, we confess to our own brokenness, to the ways we wound our lives, the lives of others, and the life of the world. And of course, we know this is only in part. And God forgives what we know and what we can now not fully know. God's forgiveness movement began there on the cross and began to grow across the world. When one of the leaders of the early church, Stephen, was being stoned to death, he prayed, echoing Jesus, Lord, do not hold this sin against them. The movement began to spread. A number of years ago, there was a Klan rally in Ann Arbor, Michigan. Some counter-protesters to the rally showed up and began beating a Klansman who was wearing a Confederate flag. An Associated Press photographer captured the scene. And the photograph was an 18-year-old black young woman named Keisha Thomas. She had intervened and was shielding the racist, shielding him with her own body. And there he was on the ground skin-headed, tattooed, wearing a t-shirt with what looked like a racist slur. And there she was, child of God, raised in Jesus' forgiveness movement, placing her own body between his attackers and him. Another story. As a young man, the civil rights leader and later Senator John Lewis was almost beaten to death, his skull cracked open during the Civil Rights March across the Edmund Pettus Bridge in Selma. Governor George Wallace had sent the troops to Selma to beat the marchers back. Years later, Wallace was left paralyzed by a would-be assassin's bullet, and now in a wheelchair, Wallace called Lewis to come visit. Lewis came. I'm not sure I would have. He said to Lewis, John, can you find it in your heart to forgive me? Lewis said, yes, Governor, I forgive you. Then Governor Wallace asked, do you think God has it in his heart to forgive me? And John Lewis replied, Governor Wallace, I'm even more certain about that. He'd been raised in the book of forgiveness. The forgiveness movement goes on and we can join. Forgiveness is so challenging, difficult, so crucial to the path of well-being and healing. That's why we can call the Bible the book of forgiveness. Forgiveness is a path, a path we choose. Acknowledging our need for forgiveness, accepting forgiveness ourselves, forgiving others, forgiving others and ourselves are all part of that path, a longer path than we sometimes want, a more difficult path than we sometimes want. But there are things that illumine that path. Here are some. First, there is the trust that God is at work to make of our hurts a healing, to make of the worst hurts of the world an avenue, an avenue for the healing and wholeness of the world. God is improvising every day on our behalf and the world's, planning it over. 
that what is darkest can be turned to light. For me, predestination means that God plans, then plans it over for our good and the good of the world. It is happening all the time, even when we cannot see it. The second is the acknowledgement that, that we too are in need of forgiveness, that we too have done things that harmed others, and that we, like those who crucified Jesus, have done harm that we do not know or cannot acknowledge now. God has already forgiven you completely. Third, uh, forgiveness is not an acceptance that what another has done to you is okay. It was a wrong. Nor is restoration of relationship the goal of every act of forgiveness. To forgive and forget, as the expression goes, is not only impossible, it may well set us up to be harmed again. Forgiveness can help you walk away. Fourth, that word forgiveness in the Greek means to loose. That is, to loose somebody from their sins. We set them free from their sins and its crippling residue of guilt and shame and remorse and regret. It can set you and me free. Forgiveness is a letting go of the pain of the past. The word resentment means literally to feel again, to re-feel, to feel again and keep on feeling the pain and hurt of the past. God wants to set you free from that pain and hurt. The last step for today, forgiveness is a process. It is rarely completed in a moment or a week or a year. The famous Christian C.S. Lewis wrote in his diary that he woke up one morning and finally discovered he had forgiven someone he thought he had forgiven decades before. On that Sunday evening of the first Easter, the disciples were huddled in fear behind locked doors. Then the risen Jesus appeared to them. Peace, he said to them, and a second time, peace, because sometimes we need to hear it more than once. Then he said, as the Abba has sent me, so send I you. And then he blew on them his own breath and said, receive the Holy Spirit, because anyone who thinks they can be sent to do Christ's holy work without the Holy Spirit, without Christ, is fooling themselves and will soon find out. Then he gave his first command as he commissioned them. Go, loose people of your sins. The forgiveness movement had begun. And he invites us to join his forgiveness movement and his forgiveness community. We need the community to be part of the movement. It is in community we learn to forgive. We learn to accept God's forgiveness, to forgive others, and to take our own life in our arms as a child and forgive ourselves. When the opponents of Jesus saw him forgive someone of their sin, they called it blasphemy. And they said only God has the power to forgive sins. They were partly right, but what they missed was that God needs us to help people be forgiven. Regular people like us who join the forgiveness movement of Jesus. Amen.